All right, hello everybody. We're headed back down the river. Um, we're observing the blugas, enjoying the bluga whales. So um, that's what we've been up to since getting on the water here. But um, figured we'd hop on the mics as I'm seeing uh, there's a few questions that are popping up. So I think we can kind of dive right into those. Uh, first, I think I'll let uh, Valeria and Flavio um, just introduce themselves and maybe chat about um, what it is they do or their work and, and that sort of thing. So Valeria, if you want to say hi to everybody. Um, there, that's on there. There we go. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Valeria Vergara. Uh, I am a marine mammal research scientist with the Raincoast Conservation Foundation out of uh, British Columbia, Canada. I'm the co-director there of the uh, cetacean research uh, program, a great new program at Raincoast that I co-direct with Lance Garrett Leonard. And I have been studying beluga whale communication for about 20 years now. Oh, wow. <laughs> so um, anything communication related, I might be able to answer. <laughs> cool. Well, I know we got some of those questions. So Yeah, I'll pass it on to Flavio. Great. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Flavio Lehner. Uh, I'm an assistant professor uh, at Cornell University, and I'm really a climate scientist. So uh, for like the last 15 years, I've been studying various aspects of climate change uh, using both observations and computer models uh, and ranging in sort of geographical regions. Uh, yeah, from the tropics all the way to the Arctic. Of course, today we're in Churchill, so uh, hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit about this region and the Arctic in general and what's happening with climate change here. And so, yeah, looking forward to your questions and chatting with our great people here. Excellent, thanks. I know we spoke with um, Katie Florco, who was on the boat with us uh, recently, and we were talking about the capelin and some other fish species and how it might look for them in the future if we continue on this current trajectory versus you know, if we curb our emissions and, um, you know, make a change here. And I think, well, I don't know if you can speak on a little bit on that. Um, I think she was saying uh, currently we'd <coughs> start to see changes in the, um, say, the Hudson Bay, for example, if we continue to see sea ice decline, um, what that might look for, say, the skelpin and the capelin and the different types of fish species, there's likely to be changes in response to that. Yeah, certainly. Um, so climate change, in a way, uh, one thing that I always sort of want to emphasize from the get-go is that it's not some distant uh, future thing that's going to happen. Uh, it's we're in the middle of it. Uh, climate has been changing for a couple of decades at quite a rapid pace, uh, and we could sort of first observe it with just the global temperature. It's been getting warmer, but then uh, obviously in certain regions there is uh, other aspects that are changing that then start to affect. Uh, fisheries um, but the main thing is really temperatures are, are rising and like in a, in a region that depends on on, on sea ice uh, and all kinds of aspects of the water cycle this of course has profound uh, profound impacts if temperature are increasing at the rate they are now uh, and so a lot of animals uh, and maybe Valeria can speak more to that in a minute but a lot of animals are really adapted to a particular temperature range as well as other aspects of the climate system and so as we change it uh, the, the regions where they their habitat was uh, starts to shift and they have to try to adapt but it's not always clear that that this is possible mm -hmm. I think polar bears and belugas are probably a great example of that right they're so heavily dependent on the sea ice and as we continue to see reduced um, sea ice uh, it's going to be very difficult for those belugas and those bears who they, well, the bears, they not only rely, it, say, as a platform to hunt from, um, but it's important to note that the sea ice actually forms the base of the food web through the algae growth that occurs on the underside. Um, so without the algae, uh, you will basically see that Arctic food web collapse, I guess, right? Um, yeah, exactly. I think for polar bears uh, and, and belugas in particular, uh, sea ice is an important component of their habitat. and. Uh, sea ice disappearing with warming is probably one of the clearest signals of climate change we're seeing. It's pretty straightforward. We all know it when we get an ice cream in summer. Uh, uh, if it's a warm day, it melts faster than on a cold day. And so it's just the same happening to sea ice uh, in the Arctic. Uh, and with that, I think an important component of the habitat of yeah, polar bears, belugas and other species is changing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Well, we got some. Some visitors. Oh, we got some whales on the starboard side who are coming along. Um, we're now kind of battling the wind and a little bit of the current here, trying to make our way back down the river. Um, 
I scrolled down a little ways. I didn't. I wanted to make sure not to miss any questions. So um, we have one. I'm not sure, uh, Valeria. It's. Do you know how belugas sleep? <laughs> yeah, I love talking about how belugas sleep. Sleep because it is fascinating. They um, cetaceans uh, breathe voluntarily. They have respiration is under voluntary control. So they have to think about every breath they take. So if they, you know, when they fall asleep, if they didn't use just one hemisphere at a time, they would drown. So whales only sleep when, with one half of their brain at, at any given time. Wow, and I think I've heard that's the case with other cetaceans as well, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, all cetaceans are, yeah. uh, you know, respiration is voluntary. And that and makes sense, right? Because the belugas are, they're say foraging, for example, and they're they have to decide when they when have to decide when to take hold a breath their breath when to breathe aquatic animals yeah. <laughs> that depend on air and uh, uh, they don't yeah they don't want to take a breath at the wrong time mm, yeah <laughs> um, part two of that question then was uh, if they ever vocalize during sleep so um, kind of I guess it would be maybe sleep talking like people sometimes talk in their sleep so do bluegas do know, the same I would I don't know the answer is I don't know I suspect they would very well be able to vocalize in their sleep especially given the fact that they sleep with one half of their brain at a time so you often when they're sleeping you often see them what we call logging or, or displacing very very slowly in the water so it's not like all their functions cease yeah. they're actually very slowly swimming when they sleep oh, so they cool. might very well be able to vocalize but mm, that's kind of a it's fun just a guess <laughs> a fun question um, and here I'm going to make my way up. We're getting lots of fantastic snapshots that I'm scrolling through in between oh, questions. Um, lots of underwater shots. We, uh, or is there any kind of new information or can you speak about like some things that you found during your research um, regarding vocalizations? Sure, yeah. The, the part that I am the most fascinated about is uh, the paper that I published with Mariana Mikas, my, my longtime research assistant about two years ago um, that talks about the fact that beluga whales may have individual signature calls. Um, a lot of my research for the last 20 years looked at contact calls, which is a really, really important call that belugas use for group cohesion and for mother-calf contact. And determining the function of at least one of the calls in their very, very rich repertoire was super exciting you know we were very excited when we when we discovered that contact calls can be so clearly identified because they sound so very different than the rest of the beluga repertoire and then we we looked into contact calls farther we learned that little calves are not born knowing these contact calls but that they have to learn them and it takes a long time much I was going to ask how years. what the process then of you know, coming up with that contact call was so that's interesting that yeah it, it, it takes them about two years to be able to pronounce it and then we, we continue to look into contact calls and in in a, a location in the arctic uh, where we had whales regularly uh, come to little pools up the river and getting trapped in those pools temporarily while the tide was low it meant that we had little groups that we could count and we could record and we had a repeated experiment that was a totally natural experiment where we had whales that would just be only contact calling uh -huh. because presumably they wanted to communicate with the whales that stayed outside of the of the canal and so we recorded 14 of these entrapments and found a really really strong correlation between the number of individuals entrapped in in the pool at any given time and the number of different contact calls that we had down to the fact that when we had a, a single animal entrapped we had a single contact call type so that told us that belugas very likely have individually distinct contact calls that they use to to enunciate their own uh, their own name essentially so does that then like yeah. that kind of suggests then that like um, they know each other like you know oh individuals yeah. right there would be there yeah. must then that must mean there's like relationships between individuals very and strong relationships they, we call belugas the butterflies of the whale world it is social butterflies oh of, yeah. the <laughs> of the whale world because they are just such a sociable species they um, live in, in 
in herds that can range from 50 animals to a thousand animals at any given time and within those herds you have these matrilineal units of grandmothers and mothers and and offspring and offspring from previous years that are just they, they loosely associate with other such units and they come and go and socialize and the little little uh, infants form uh, kindergarten groups and uh, they're babysat by by an older usually an, an older whale and then uh, females will uh, help each other raise their young and uh, males will form very long-term friendships that you know they you know there, there are groups of males that have been photographed together for decades in the St. Lawrence That's River. That's amazing. So they're very very sociable so in the context of that very deep sociality having a way to tell each other who they are in a very dark aquatic environment mm -hmm. you know imagine the arctic sometimes the sun doesn't even come yeah out. yeah so vision is very the saint lawrence where the visibility is very the poor saint lawrence exactly so just having a way to maintain these very long-term social relationships and keep track of one another needs to be acoustic not visual that's so amazing and uh, it makes me think you know here where it's that must be so complex because we have thousands of whales who are spending their summers mm -hmm. like in the estuary around this so area yeah. and I don't know I imagine it must be kind of like you know Churchill's got a population of say seven to eight hundred people and I don't uh, you know I know a lot of the folks who live here but I don't know everybody and I'm That's maybe right. not interacting with everybody or I'm not friends with everybody and you know you're friendly with everybody but not necessarily uh, it's yeah that's yeah. bizarre so it must be sort of a similar setup right obviously say there's you know a couple thousand whales here they're not all friends and buddy buddy with each other right I imagine they're they, uh, th separate that's groups that's and really really well put Kieran and, and uh, yeah by listening to one another especially by listening for each other's contact calls a whale gets an idea of who she or he is surrounded by at any given time wow yeah and um, it's all that's very cool then that they're it's kind of like I guess they're given a name right the young ones it's like a baby doesn't uh, you well you a baby acquires very slowly the the contact call that that uh, he or she hears from mom and then what we don't know I is whether that infant eventually uh, shifts this contact call a little bit and develop its own makes it their own okay. you know, or, or if mothers and, and infants always share the same contact call that those are the kinds of questions that we're beginning to explore in the St. Lawrence where there's a large portion of the population that is photo identified. So one of the things we're doing is we're pairing uh, photo identified whales that are uh, being uh, temporarily tagged with D-tags that record their sounds mm -hmm. with the contact calls that they produce to, to, to test this idea that, that contact calls are individually specific. So it's I wonder because yeah. the if the you said possibly the mother shares the same contact call, yeah. um, and the calves typically spend is it two around two years ish with the mother before they kind of separate or yeah it can be longer there are you know uh, family groups that have uh, been documented to spend many more years and that together generally the the male uh, calves will when they especially when they're teenagers they'll go off with other males and form these youth bands mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but yeah we don't we don't know how long uh, so i wonder if that gets confusing then if they have similar calls then you know it's like hey bob and there's six people in the room That's named right. bob and it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know everybody's paying attention um yeah so many questions like we don't know if you know animals that are very closely related and that and that tend to travel together on their migratory routes year after year perhaps share a little set of contact calls that that is distinct from that of other family groups we still need to there's so much to find out well it's uh, baby steps yeah this, this well and it's making me think you know more about our blue Gibbets project and we've had a few we call them recaptures so yeah. where we've um, identified individuals you know over multiple years and kind of makes you think then if you can see you know that individual also documenting the other whales that it's with right to learn more if you know yeah. um, if this thing is this whale spending time with the same group as well and um, learning more about those different dynamics those yeah, social structures and um, wow there's lots of parallels lots of similarities between kind of how we do things and like I like you mentioning the youth bands right these little groups of of youth maybe troublemakers I don't know they're more mischievous or adventurous or I know we see the males are 
bolder. They typically will be the ones who are spending more time with the boat or getting up, you know, a little bit closer. But very curious. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's very cool. Um, See, so here's another question here: If um, different pods use different dialects, or I guess maybe expanding on that, like subpopulations, like so whales in other parts of the Arctic. Yeah, so th that's a great question. Um, I um, uh, collaborated with a, a student that just uh, completed a, her master's uh, thesis a couple of years ago. Her name is Karen Boy. Hi, Karen, if you're listening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she did a great little project comparing contact calls, uh, geographic um, variation between contact calls in different populations, analyzing recordings from the Buffered Sea and, and Cunningham Inlet and the St. Lawrence and Churchill. And she found um, some, uh, d uh, some distinctions, some differences between uh, the populations. That, though, wouldn't be a true dialect. That would be a geographic variation um, in, in um, the parameters of a vocalization. A true dialect is when sympatric populations or sympatric groups that uh, come in, into contact with each other have different repertoires of sound and that is what we're looking into so if in they the would be unable to communicate or understand each other is that kind of they would understand each other but they would have identifying repertoires mm. that uh, would have, for example would allow us humans to separate that group acoustically people in, in on the west coast have been following killer whales monitoring killer whale populations for years because we know what each pod sounds like and those pods have different dialects and these are true dialects because the pods actually come into contact with one another so it's not a geographic separation that mm -hmm. occurs it's actually a dialect much like a person uh, you know i don't know uh, um, two different groups of people in the same city speaking slightly differently yeah that kind of thing so what we're doing in this in lawrence um with um, my uh, student jacqueline oben is looking into the question uh, of whether three presumed female communities, which are assemblages of females and young that associate preferentially and use three different areas of the same St. Lawrence estuary. I just got back from, from there uh, before coming to Churchill and uh, yeah, very curious to see what she finds out. It's going to be so challenging. Um. Oh yeah, this 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 field. <laughs> when you're trying to understand the repertoire of one of the most loquacious species on Earth that has an, an incredibly complex communication system that parallels ours in complexity, it's baby steps. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and countless hours every, of recordings. Every discovery and is, is is super exciting. Yeah, to and us. then builds yeah. on. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, Sorry, I'm just scanning through, checking out other questions. Um, yeah, so we had the, we you kind of say they have a very complex. So I guess, do we know how many different vocalizations can they make? Like, is there any sort of number that you can apply the to that? Or? Yeah, the numbers vary tremendously from study to study to study. Um, that has to do a lot with the fact that they produce so many sounds and that their communication system is graded rather than discrete, which means that one vocalization will blend into another and will blend into another, that there is some disagreement between researchers about how to parse their vocabulary. So there has been anywhere from 28 vocalizations to 52 in some studies. I think they have many, many, many more than that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, no agreement yet yeah, on how many. Yeah, well, on how many sounds they produce. Just comes back to yeah, how difficult it <laughs> it must be for sure. Yeah. Um, I was wanting to maybe I'm checking here on uh, more questions. We'll try to get to all of them as we scroll through the message board. Absolutely. Um, so here's another. Uh, is there a difference in how young beluga communicate compared to adults? That is a really great question. Um, for, for a number of reasons, both out of interest and because it has conservation implications. Mm. The interesting part is that belugas are not born knowing the belu beluga sounds. They really, when they're born, they just produce this one sound that's called a click, a cl pulse train or a click train that is very, very, a very soft series of, of pulses. 
and it sounds very much as if you were running your finger, try running your finger through a plastic cone and you will hear that kind of raspy sound. Really? That's what a little beluga calf sounds like. As they age, they start acquiring all of the large, rich repertoire of belugas, but this takes years. And so that the fact that they produce such soft sounds during the first couple of weeks of life means that they're very vulnerable to noise, underwater noise pollution mm. that can mask these very soft sounds and make it so that if mothers and ca mother mother and calf separate for whatever reason, mom might have a hard time orienting to her calf and finding it again. Oh wow! Well. Um, so, one of the perils of underwater noise pollution, and it's one of the things that we um, we do at Raincoast is at Raincoast is try and understand how how important understanding communication in cetaceans is in terms of understanding the impacts of noise on their ability to both communicate and ecolocate and find prey. Wow, I, I feel like I've heard that noise, um, <laughs> but I, mean, I was going to ask then, and you sort of answered the question, like how pronounced it is, you know, if there is it, you know, the same uh, volume as the adults are communicating, no. it, but it sounds like much quieter, so much softer, yeah. we hear it, I'm trying to imagine, you know, running your thumb across the comb, what that sounds like, and I've heard um, similar calls that are more raspy. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so you, a, a cont an adult contact call is unmistakable. Hmm. It sounds like a hybrid between, let's say, a creaky, rusty door and a chainsaw. That's what a contact call yeah, sounds okay, like yeah. They're very loud. <laughs> and very strident and raspy you can yeah so the fact that they kind of sound similar like the contact calls to us but the whales are able to differentiate between them is really amazing too how sensitive they are yeah. to oh um, yeah. whatever the minor little tweaks or changes are and, um, incredibly sensitive hearing did you know that we in the best case scenario we humans hear to you know up to 20 kilohertz that's 20,000 hertz or cycles per second. Just remember that sound is, 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 is a, uh, a, a wave, a pulse wave, um, a pressure wave. And belugas have a hearing capacity of up to 150 kilohertz. That's 150,000 hertz per, s it's, it's oh, wow. you know, over 10 times more than a human's capacity to hear. And then to so process it all and stuff. And yeah. Yeah, amazing mm. ability to um, to use sound. As so that kind of then, um, I've got lots of questions that we'll pick away at as well, <laughs> like besides what we were seeing on the message board here, but um, that made me think then uh, if you could explain just how they produce their vocalizations, how they, they the sound like that they're, you know, we got ears, that's how we hear, oh like no. how it works with the belugas. It's such an alien, mm -hmm. alien way of doing it. It's I, I o always like to say that they speak through their no noses instead of through their vocal cords because they have you know that they breathe through the blowhole and the blowhole is is up at the top of their um uh, their bodies so um it's easier to breathe and at the very very bottom of their blowhole they have two um structures two mirror structures that are called the phonic lips um Sometimes people call them the monkey lips because they really do resemble the lips of a monkey. And there are two structures that are muscle and fatty tissue. Um, they're called the dorsal lips. The uh, um, Sorry, I forgot about uh, the, the, the scientific name. But they um, open and close these two structures very, very fast, um, pulsing, sort of creating a, a series of pulses and passing air through the structures and directing this uh, air to the melon that contains a kind of acoust uh, liquid or oily substance that acts as an acoustic lens. And belugas, you will see them move their melon. Mm -hmm. uh, That's very so crazy to it's see. It's crazy <laughs> to see. And they can direct um, the sound through this acoustic lens to exactly where they want it so they can, s they can speak very directional oh so they're pinpointing you know similar to like if i was speaking with you i kind of turned to face you and um you know it's it very yeah. obvious that i'm talking with you so in a way very i guess you know probably too in the estuary here where we sometimes you know have hundreds or thousands of whales um 
you probably want that ability to kind of direct. They can do it. We we don't have that ability. When we l lower a hydrophone into the water, um, the sound comes to it omnidirectionally. Mm -hmm. Sound transmits five times faster in water than in air, so it's very hard for humans to understand who is speaking. Uh, but whales can do it, and whales can also direct sound uh, for echolocation purposes. So they have this ability to really direct their echolocation beam and then catch the echoes that come back and get a really good read of either their environment or another whale or prey that wow. they might be after. I've heard too that sometimes they'll invert themselves. We always see them on the camera yeah. up and you know up and down. They kind of they're quite uh, the uh, acrobats, I guess, under the water. But they can do that to better direct their sound towards the seafloor if they're foraging or looking for food on the on the bottom. Yeah, um, the, they uh, they do that quite a bit. It's true. Seeing their melons move, like I I've got to. I've saw it a few times and it's really on camera I bet it happens quite a bit. Yeah, it's yeah. cool to like see how they can morph it and sort of uh yeah, it's very <laughs> very interesting, really weird to to see it yeah, firsthand. So, uh, I didn't realize oh, it's really interesting and oh, and I was going to mention too then they're uh the monkey lips, I can't remember the the term you used for them. Is yeah, that phonic, similar phonic, sonic lips or phonic lips or monkey lips? Three ways of It sounds kind of like um like our vocal cords in a way, like how they contract and expand yeah, to... Yeah, it's a very similar idea. It's just located in, in in a different part of the body, of course. And we're not passing our sound through an oily substance or... Yeah, yeah so it's all, yeah. it's of course different, but just making some comparisons. Um, and of course they receive the sound very differently too, because they don't have, you know, outer ears. So they will receive the sound through the lower jaw. Um, oh, wow. And then the sound will get directed to the inner ear. Oh jeez! Yeah. <laughs> so very foreign. Very wild, yeah. Um, I was this. I'm reading a question, and we kind of touched on it. Uh, and then it's actually sort of a cool question: if they learn language as they get older. So I know, say, if I'm reading lots of books and stuff, I can expand my vocabulary, you know, all the way up until I die, right? Like you could always be learning new words yeah. and and stuff. Is that? Do you think that's sort of the case with the belugas at all? You know, belugas are known to acquire sounds that they hear this we know this from from uh, anecdotal evidence from captive belugas that they copy human sounds they copy the sounds that are around their their pool such as the sounds of, of birds or of, or if they hear other species such as dolphins they'll acquire those sounds they're we know that belugas are very very good vocal imitators wow. um, so that tells me that they can acquire sounds well into adulthood Mm -hmm. you know, why not? I guess, but right? But Just based off their environment, or that's yeah. right. But I mean, how do you study the acquisition of, you know, of, of dialects or the acquisition of uh, sounds that are different from their own out in the wild? It would be very, very hard to do. But mm -hmm. my hunch, just from the anecdotal evidence from captivity, is that they do oh. have that ability. Um, I, I'm going to ask a question here, and then I'm going to scroll. We've got, I see since I last checked 65 snapshot slash questions so <laughs> okay. I'm gonna scroll through those as we're chatting but um, the difference say between the vocalizations they use for hunting versus like communicating you know if they're looking for prey yeah um, so when they're looking for prey what they do is they echolocate and echolocation consists of a very very uh, short um, clicks that form click trains they generally don't start um, there's no acoustic energy in echolocation clicks for belugas below about 30 kilohertz. So often their echolocation sounds are inaudible to us unless the beluga is very, very close to the hydrophone, in which case we sometimes can hear the echolocation buzzes. And as they approach the prey or the target, they increase the pulse repetition rate of the clicks and to our uh, human ears that would sound like a buzz in fact we call it a terminal buzz the sound just before they're zoning into the to the prey uh, before they catch it essentially so they they play around with the speed of the of these uh, click trains so it must be extremely sensitive say um, I watched a beluga target one individual capelin this year yeah. Right? And, uh, oh, yeah. you know, it honed in on that thing and then followed it around until it eventually ate it. It was Absolutely. really cool to watch. But 
Um, yeah, do you, do you know, kind of, or have an idea of how sensitive they're... I've also heard stories, say, in other populations that are less friendly than the beluga whales here in Churchill. Um, if you just, like, wade into the water and there's belugas in their area, they'll disperse and oh, head so in the opposite really direction. So they're, yeah. you know, so keen um, on their surroundings, like, they can tell if you know, you're up to your knees in the water, there's something there yeah. that they're uninterested in. And Sound is essentially to belugas what vision is to us, even more so, I would say. You know, they are an incredibly sound-centered species. And uh, um, I just, I always think about the fact that often in the St. Lawrence, you will put a finger in the water and not see your fingernail. You know, and these are animals that stay with each other for years and years and years. They rely on on one another. They form incredibly long-term relationships. And so sound is the glue of their society. They are constantly vocalizing and listening in for cues, listening, listening for each other and echolocating on their environment to see, to see, uh, and quote unquote, um, <laughs> where to go to navigate basically. it's um, and it's so hard for us to even begin to understand what that must be like um, we also say with the polar bears they see with their noses right yes, their exactly. um, sense of smell is so refined yeah. um, that they're navigating um, their world out on the sea ice uh, following their nose yeah. so um, and yeah like I know I think I've heard before if you want to try to understand say how a bloodhound smells you know like their powerful sense of smell um, when you s when you smell a skunk like that's such a strong scent um, and we can smell it at such low parts per million it's kind of a way to think about yeah. you know um, bloodhounds or bears like how they're in able to in interpret the world around them right um, they're picking up on very very small amounts of um, scents and yeah. yeah oh very very cool um. and right now they're being I think I'm hearing some vocalizations though it's hard to make out do you think oh so that kind of made me think as well uh i've got all these i'm trying to remember the questions i want to <laughs> ask but uh so say in the saint lawrence or when the belugas are north when they migrate in the winter and they're spending you know that part of the year in a place where it could be dark for you know it's dark 24 hours a day right so they're having to really heavily rely on their echolocation and the communicating um, here where right now we're in some pretty good visibility and stuff do you think that they you'd hear less vocalizations because they'd be say using sight to uh, I, I don't know I, I honestly think that when you have a, s a sense that you can use it's so it, you just powerful it, yeah you know? you just no matter yeah. no matter what yeah and um. often, I mean, I've, <laughs> I think the busiest recordings I've ever made have been here in the Churchill estuary, and that's because you might have a thousand whales at any given time vocalizing in a narrow river, <laughs> so and sound transmits very well, so it's, uh, yeah. Do they create, in a way, like their own noise pollution then in that case? Like, how can they possibly oh, figure out what's going on? Yeah. It must be like being in a stadium at a concert filled absolutely. with people. You nailed it. It's called the cocktail party effect. Oh, cool. And, it's <laughs> how to it, and it really is called the cocktail party effect in biology, and it's how do animals learn to disentangle the vocalizations that are important from the background chatter of the species. And this is one of the reasons why we think contact calls sound so different than the rest of the beluga repertoire. Mm -hmm. Belugas are called the sea canaries for a reason. They chirp and they whistle a lot. Yet you have these very abrasive chainsaw sounding contact calls. And that's because whenever I show people a recording that contains contact calls, no matter how many chirps and whistles you hear in the background, the contact calls are unmistakable. Mm -hmm. And they are probably very unmistakable to belugas as well. They can probably pick out a conspecific contact call at the distance in the crazy background chatter of the species. So that'd be like in that cocktail party, everybody's chatting and it's just this mush of, you know, you can't make out one conversation from the next and then someone blows a whistle in the middle and it's like, what was that, right? Yeah, that's going to stand out, right. of, you know, oh, that's... And then do they, their contact calls, like they must use them then less frequently as well? Is it for they specific? Yeah, good, good. Because otherwise they can drown out yeah. all these other contact so, calls. So uh, from um, analysis of recordings in three populations, in the St. Lawrence, in Churchill, and in Cunningham Inlet, on a regular basis when you just, you know, uh, when, when nothing out of the ordinary is happening, they use contact calls about 10% of the time. 
when suddenly something urgent that requires for them to use tentacles occurs, such as the whales becoming entrapped in a river canal, they switch to where 60 to 80 percent of their calls become contactless. Oh, okay. So it, it really contactless act as indicators. So they're really in wanting to coordinate in that. Exactly, and then another thing that we, you know, I was doing here in Churchill in 2017 uh, during a short s stay, and then we continue, we continued this study in the St. Lawrence is compare the contact call rates in uh, groups that contain little youngsters like newborns mm -hmm. and for example all male groups um, and definitely and I don't can't I won't quote the percentages but absolutely there is a significant difference in the rate of production of contact calls where you know that if a group is producing contact calls quite a bit they probably have newborns they're the keeping group. track of them hey get over here like yeah, yeah where are you yeah. going um, moms tend to to enunciate their own signature contact call to imprint the little cast. I was going to say, is it repetitions yeah. for the sake of um, I'm here, I'm teachi here, I'm here, and teaching the, the babies too, like maybe to learn their own and just to yeah reaffirm that they're right. there. And you always see these vocal exchanges, you know, you hear a maternal contact call and you hear a calf call, so it's a, uh, you know, a back and forth uh, all the time. Wow. Yeah. Uh, the, so the, when they're searching for prey and like are those pulses that they're using and then you said they get more and more frequent as they near the the fish that they're after um, are they like a stronger pulse right and then they're getting that rebound um, right. so similar to like a bat in their sonar yeah absolutely so the the, the sounds produced for communication and for echolocation are, are produced on the same organ they're produced in the same way but echolocation clicks are very different than than pulsed calls uh, so when I talk about a click train for a little calf, those are like very thick pulses that are a little longer in duration and they, they have a, a bigger interpulse interval than the very, uh, very brief echolocation pulses that where every click is very short and sharp and they're ultrasonic usually mm. and they can become very, very rapid, very mm. uh, quick uh, click repetition rate. Oh. So cool, we got, um, I think, more questions coming in here. Um, so this one kind of touches on, I'm going to read through it, but um, a little bit on like the noise pollution, say, in okay. the St. Lawrence versus yeah. here in Churchill. Um, right. So uh, the St. Lawrence is an industrialized area. Um, there are... Uh, there's not o only noise from uh, ecotourism and for from uh, pleasure boats, which are much more uh, frequent than here in Churchill, but there's unfortunately quite a bit of noise from uh, shipping. Um, it's just a very industrial area, so it is a much noisier uh, area than here. In Bay St. Marguerite, uh, where I conducted my research for, for a few years from a research tower, it was we, you know, the moments of silence, the moments of just, you know, an acoustic soundscape that had no human noise pollution or vessel noise pollution, those moments were few and far between uh, during our stays in the tower. Uh, where in Churchill, you occasionally have some uh, noise from uh, uh, tour uh, operators, although it's not a huge amount of noise because generally uh, whale watching tours tend to go very slowly in Churchill. And the more you reduce the speed of your engine, the less uh, the less the noise uh, output. It really makes a different a difference. Um, and I also haven't seen too many ships. Um, no. <laughs> and even on a busy season, uh, yeah. like I'm not sure what it was like in the past. Here we have Canada's only deep water Arctic port in Churchill, uh, and in the past they used it for shipping grain. Um, now they they do some grain, but um, and I imagine this was always the case also, they used the train to bring up vehicles and building materials and supplies and all that sort of thing. And then they have these sea lifts, these large ships that come in, load all the materials on board. We had one earlier uh, this season already. And then they, you know, sail these boats north and then distribute everything, you know, throughout the communities in Nunavut. Um, so, but again, it's like in comparison to the St. Lawrence, like very, yeah. yeah, it's not that frequent. Very like. Different. 
and we do see a difference. I know there's been uh, researchers up who've looked at that, like when a ship comes into port, um, how the behavior with the beluga whales change. And oftentimes we've noticed too that the whales kind of aren't around so much in the estuary when that boat's coming or going. I've noticed that in 2017 when with the only ship, because it was there was a, the closure of the port of Churchill that mm -hmm. year that I was here, but we did have one ship and tugboat uh, come in and it, you know, uh, it was noticeable how the whales cleared the area pretty pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it is important to continue to understand the effects, to study the effects of underwater noise in areas like Churchill, because presumably this area will get busier and busier as the ice continues to recede and the, you know, the ice-free season becomes, be becomes longer and the amount of, of human activities that marine uh, human activities that, that can be developed as a result will likely increase. Yeah, and um, I wanted to point out too, like just for people tuning in when we're we're puttering i say puttering because we are we're just puttering around in the in the bay and um as a part of the beluga bits project which is our citizen science project we do have uh, G a small gps device on board called the bad elf so we're recording um, the tour each day and we can see where we were in the estuary and then we could actually link it up and we can see where we took photos in the estuary so all the snapshots that you guys are putting up on the message board right now um, paired with the GPS we could actually see our locations where each shot was taken which is uh, very interesting and used um, as additional data for the project but what I wanted to say is we're averaging right now we're going about 2.4 knots ish um, so we on average during the four hour tour but when we're on the water we're about five kilometers um, three to five kilometers I'd say um, so the you know the motors kind of more or less idling. Very quiet. We, we can hear the whales uh, through the hydrophones, which is a big indicator of how quiet yeah. the motor is. And, and another thing with underwater noise to, to that I, I, I'd like to emphasize, because often we have these big environmental problems with no solutions, and noise is so easy to solve, you just turn it down. Yeah. And uh, there are a lot of very effective ways to do that. The main one is slow down. It really, really makes a difference. Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, there are all sorts of new ways to avoid propeller cavitation, which is one of the main culprits. Propellers are being designed differently. Um, there's a lot of things uh, r for big ships, retrofits to the engine room, for instance, that can decouple uh, the noise and the vibrations and, and can you know, create uh, much more uh, quiet boats. Can you define the cavitation because that is quite loud, is it not? Like that's a major yeah, problem with. Yeah, propeller cavitation. And I, I'm, you know, I would lie if I could, uh, if I told you that I could describe the exact process. But it really has to do with. It's much like uh, when you're boiling water and it's those uh, 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 little bubbles, thousands, millions of bubbles uh, um, that contain air with the propeller uh, rotating, coming to the surface and exploding, creating noise, essentially. And there uh, are non-cavitating propellers that are being designed um, and are coming out onto the market more and more. So I think it's really about awareness and uh, uh, people starting to to adopt those. And we have a really beautiful group of whales just no. uh, following us. So I got a little distracted there. <laughs> yeah. I know I do and trail off it, you know, as you're talking because you're totally sidetracked. This is probably the nicest way to be interviewed about beluga communication, being <laughs> surrounded by easily 40 whales. <laughs> <laughs> so unique, yeah. It's beautiful, yeah. Um, we do have cavitation plates on these motors, like if you wanted to Google and see, you know, what that's all about. Um, so that's to help, they're meant to reduce or reduce the cavitation, but we do notice it like... Uh, the other day when we were on the Zodiac, uh, there's a piece of kelp that was stuck to the skag on the bottom end of our motor and it was causing cavitation and it's very noticeable. And, <laughs> and there got whales on the starboard side. Um, but yeah, for us, I think um, puttering around and you know, these smaller engines are quite a bit uh, quieter too than the larger ones. And yeah. so I think, um, We'll maybe hop off the mics for a few moments, and I'm going to look through. We'll get to the questions. I see there. I think there's some more here, uh, and we'll hop back on in a few minutes and talk some more. But uh, otherwise, we're just going to cruise around in the estuary for a bit. Wonderful.